Wormwood, the real trouble about the set that your patient is currently living in is that it is merely Christian. They all have their own individual interests, of course, but the bond remains mere Christianity. What we want, if people are going to become Christians at all, is to keep them in the state of mind I like to call Christianity and. You know, Christianity and the crisis. Christianity and the new order. Christianity and faith healing. Christianity and veganism. Christianity and spelling reform. If they must be Christians, let them be Christians with a difference. Substitute for the faith itself some fashion with a Christian coloring. And keep them always horrified of the same old thing. The horror of the same old thing is one of the most valuable passions we have produced in the human heart. An endless source of heresies in religion, folly in counsel, inconstancy in friendship, and infidelity in marriage. The humans live in time and experience reality successively. Therefore, to experience all of it, they must experience many different things. That is, they must experience change. Since they need change, the enemy, being a hedonist at heart, has made change pleasurable to them, much as he has made eating pleasurable. But, since he does not want change any more than eating to be an end in itself, he has also balanced this love of change with a love of permanence. He has contrived to gratify both tastes together in this world he has made with that union of change and permanence which we call rhythm. He gives them new seasons all the time, and yet every year it is the same. He has given them a spiritual year where they move from fast to feast, but every feast is the same. Now, just as we pick out and exaggerate the pleasure of eating to produce gluttony, so we can take the natural pleasantness of change and twist it to produce a demand for absolute novelty. This demand is entirely our creation. If we neglect our duty, people will be not only contented, but absolutely transported by the mixed novelty and familiarity of snowflakes again this January, or a sunrise again this morning, or turkey again this Christmas. Children, until we have taught them better, will be perfectly happy with a seasonal round of games that go from skating to hopscotch, just as surely as winter follows summer. Only by our incessant efforts is the demand for infinite, unrhythmical change kept up. This demand is valuable in various ways. In the first place, it diminishes pleasure while increasing desire. The pleasure of novelty is, by its very nature, more than any other subject to the law of diminishing returns. And continual change costs money, so that the demand for it will cause avarice or unhappiness or both. And again, the more voracious the desire, the sooner it must eat up all innocent sources of pleasure, and then move on to those the enemy forbids. Thus, by inflaming the horror of the same old thing, we have made, for example, the arts much less dangerous to us than they would have been otherwise. Every day, artists are drawn into fresh and still fresher excesses of lasciviousness, unreason, cruelty, and pride. And finally, the desire for novelty is indispensable if we are to produce fashions or vogues. The use of fashions in thought is to distract humans from their real dangers. We direct the fashionable outcry of each generation against that vice which they are least likely to have trouble with, and fix their approval on that virtue which is nearest to the vice we are trying to make endemic. The game is to get them all running about with fire extinguishers whenever there's a flood, or to get them all crowding over to the side of the boat that is already nearly gunwale under. Thus, we make it fashionable to expose the dangers of enthusiasm just as they are all really becoming worldly and lukewarm. A century later, when they are all become bryonic and emotional, we direct the fashionable outcry against the problems of mere understanding. Cruel ages are put on their guard against sentimentality, feckless and idle ones against respectability, lascivious ones against puritanism. But the greatest triumph of all is to elevate the horror of the same old thing into a philosophy so that nonsense in the intellect can reinforce corruption in the will. It is here that the general evolutionary or historical quality of thought, partly our work, comes in so useful. The enemy loves platitudes. Of a proposed course of action, he wants a human, so far as I can see, to ask simple questions. Is it righteous? Is it prudent? Is it possible? Now, if we can keep them asking, is this in accordance with the general movement of our time? Is this progressive or reactionary? Is this the way history is going? Then they will neglect the relevant questions. And the questions they ask are unanswerable, because they do not know the future. And in fact, the future depends on those choices which they are just now invoking the future to help them make. And while their minds are buzzing in this vacuum, we can more easily slip in and bend them towards that course of action that we have already decided on. And great work has already been done. Once, they knew that some changes were for the better, and some for the worse, and others again indifferent. We have largely removed this knowledge. For the descriptive adjective unchanged, we have substituted the emotional one, stagnant. We have trained them to think of the future as a promised land which favored heroes attain, not something which everyone reaches at 60 minutes an hour, no matter who they are, no matter what they do.